Good morning. Let's stand. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall.
Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest.
Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. So what could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name. contrast from a half hour ago, isn't it? <laughs> you're getting ready to go to church and you're putting on your stuff. And struggling to get out the door, maybe you got an extra hour of sleep, but you stayed an hour later, right? <laughs> and then we walk into this sanctuary and we walk in with God's people, and not that His Spirit hasn't been with you all week, because it has, but there's something about when we come together and lift up the name of Jesus that the power of His presence just kind of engulfs and, and surrounds us. You sense that this morning? I do. And it's not just to have some moments where we feel like we're unified and we're all on the same focus and the same page and we've escaped the struggles and the difficulties of this last week, but we're here to lift up the King of kings and Lord of lords. And that changes everything. Everything. I, I, I need everything changed every day for me almost. <laughs> So I'm going to pray that as God continues to move by His Spirit this morning, that He will quicken your heart and your spirit and that you will sense and know the power of God, not from just history, not from just what you remember used to be, but what you can know now. <laughs> the God of the here and now. We're going to pray for Janet Spurgeon. She's home with COVID. She's been through so much. You know, Janet sits back here and She's, she's been through, so, and she, I called her this morning, and she had enough, just enough energy to kind of talk, and I prayed with her, and I said, we'll pray for her this morning. So let's start with that, okay? Lord, we love Janet because she is your child, and 
And we love her because you give us love for her as a sister, as a part of this family. We lift her to you today. She's in desperate need, Lord. Physically, she's been broken down and she's weak. She needs strength. She needs a touch from you today. She needs not only the name of Jesus, but the presence of the Spirit of Jesus in that room with her right now. Lord, touch her by your Spirit. Raise her up so that she can give you glory as a result of your influencing and impacting her life today. May she sense your presence. May she sense our love as a family here for her. And Lord, I know there are others that are standing here on uh, weak needs spiritually and, and struggling and, and, and needing a touch from you. And I, I, I pray as we continue to worship, as we bow to your word, as we receive from you, that the answers would come for each one, that you'd intervene, that they would, you'd bring hope and a sense of completeness in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. God's good, isn't he? You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, again for leading us wonderfully. And we were singing a song there, and I, it took me back to when I was but a young, young lad of 18. Dick, that was a long time ago, wasn't it? See, if you sit over here, don't sit over here because I'll pick on you. This is kind of my go-to spot. The Dick just seems to like to be picked on, but <laughs> yeah, he does. If anybody can handle it, he can. But we were singing uh, the songs about Jesus and name of, and I just remembered Going to the altars, and again, there's nothing, I've mentioned this before, magical or supernatural about coming up to the front of the church, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of showing how serious sometimes we are to, to know and meet with God. And we'd, we'd go to the front of the church, us college age, high schoolers back when I was uh, just a young Christian, and we would just soak in the presence of God. We'd just sing those songs. And yeah, we repeated them over and over, and you can say we cut into kind of a, a dance around the fire chant. I mean, that, that's not what it was about. But man, I, I just remembered those, those times. Don't we need those times even now? We need those times where we just, just bow in His presence. Wednesday night was, was a wonderful experience. If you missed it, we had a good turnout, though. You, those of you that came, we had... We had really a good turnout, and, and you all that came enjoyed it. You that didn't, feel no shame, no guilt, unless you don't come next week. No, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to continue in our, our life story. Th it, uh, it was uh, Kathy and Dawn gave the, shared their testimony. It was, it was really powerful. Yeah, it was really good. And the food's always great, but that's coming up. I just uh, Also, we've got the harvest, uh, the harvest, uh, party, the Harvest Outreach coming up in just a couple weeks, and so we need to get the word out. So, you know, f passing flyers, hanging flyers on doors, we've done that in the past. It does produce responses. That's the, the reason we do it. We canvass the apartments over here. If you want to help uh, with passing some of these out to let the community know that we're going ha to have uh, the illusionist, Scott Wolf's going to be back here with us. We're going to do this to reach kids and families for Jesus, and so that's coming in a couple weeks, but we need you to come Friday morning. I don't know what you got going Friday mornings, but unless you're working, you can come have a time of fellowship and pass out some flyers here. We're going to meet at the church at 10 a.m., and uh, just uh, hopefully it's not raining, but even if it is, you have rain, if you have a raincoat, if... <laughs> None of you had to have umbrellas because if you're a true Oregonian, I keep telling my wife this, she's got like 25 umbrellas. She's one of the only Oregonians I know, there it is, that uses an umbrella. But the rest of us, well, you're just not a true Oregonian. <laughs> Get your hood up, you know, we can go out there and uh, pass out flyers for this. And then make sure you take note of other things in the bulletin. 
that are coming up. Uh, good stuff. I don't even have a bulletin. Isn't that terrible? The pastor doesn't even have a bulletin. He doesn't know what's going on. But you do. That's what's important, right? So let's turn to the book of Acts again for the next few moments. Acts chapter 13, we're, we're getting through this. Uh, and it's, 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 a long, it's a long book and it's a long chapter. And so I don't know how far we're going to get today, but uh, I'm not going to worry about that. We're going to just continue to march through and see what, what continued to happen as the church simply became and was the church. You know, we think of church as, as a group of people that meet in a building and we sit and we do some worship. The church is really the spirit and the action of the living God continuing to move throughout history and current events. That's the church. And this is what's exciting about the book of Acts. And it it started and it hasn't ended. So let's take a look. Herod, remember we talked about Herod and his death, and then we're going we're gonna to bounce from there and see what happened after Herod died. Verse 24, chapter 12, we'll just pick it up there. He was eaten by worms. That's pretty bad news. Anybody that's eaten by worms, unless it's a really bad guy. But then verse 24, but the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Isn't that cool? As a matter of fact, it probably even took off even greater once we got the bonehead Herod out of the way that was trying to persecute. It didn't slow down the church. It didn't slow down God's plan. And then we see in verse 25, it says, When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned to Jerusalem from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manon, who had been brought up with Herod, and the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent, their, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now, we're going to stop there. We've got a few more things we're going to weigh in later on. But just take a look at what happened here. At the end of that 12th chapter, we read that, the gospel continued. We go back to chapter 2 of Acts, verse 6, and Jesus said this, as a reminder, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What's happening? That's exactly what's taking place. First Jerusalem and then Judea, now they're moving out. See how the progression is taking place? There's no stopping the will of God when God wills something, it will happen. I want you to rest in that for just a second. There should be great comfort for us that it doesn't matter what's going around in our lives or in this world. It doesn't matter what's happening around us. Things may be on fire. They may be shifting. But God's plan is going to and will be fulfilled. Uh, You just can't stop it. You can't stop the purpose and design of God. There is no way man has ever been able to do it or will ever do it. And sometimes when we're entrenched with what we're seeing around us, it can cause us to stop and wonder at times. Wow, how could this possibly be fitting into the design and purposes of God? It's human to ask that question. It's normal. I think the New Testament church often did that. And then when they sat back and they began to allow the Spirit of God's Word and His Spirit to well up in them, they said, nope. This is God's plan. We're, in, we're still a part of this thing. Matthew, Jesus said it this way. You've heard the scriptures, very common, but we need it now more than ever. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, and he begins 
show, telling them how to pray, and it was that God's will would be done. Well, why would we pray for God's will to be done if He's already designed His will and He's a full control of that? I believe the best way to interpret this is that we pray, Lord, may my, may my life conform to Your will. May my purposes, may my future it be enveloped in Your purpose for me. May I not fight against Your will. You know, that's what the world's doing right now more than ever is they're fighting against the will of God because God's will is that none would perish, but that all would come to know Jesus Christ. His will is that everyone, so he's pressing in and he's, he's encouraging us to, to conform to his divine plans and purposes. Do you, feel, do, you, do you feel sometimes, you don't feel very divine sometimes, do you? I don't. Do you, you wake up feeling like you're fulfilling the divine purpose of God? <laughs> it's hard to, to reconcile emotions and feelings with faith sometimes. And this is a huge statement of faith. We live by faith, not by sight. In faith, we move forward to fulfill the will and purposes of God in our lives in spite of how we feel in our circumstances. Paul wrote this in Ephesians. This is, to me, one of the most profound and confusing verses in Scripture. You like confusion? I don't like confusion. But it can be confusing because it seems so predetermined. But it, it reads in this way, In Him we were chosen also, having been predestined according to His plan of Him who works out everything with the purpose of His will. He conforms us into the purpose. We've been chosen to fall in line with the purpose and design of God in our lives. Isn't that powerful? You don't really have to wonder what the will of God is in your life. Many people will wander around, what's God want me to do? What's He really got planned? For? You know what He wants you to do? He wants you to fall in love with Jesus every day. He wants you to focus in and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and life and give you faith to believe that what you encounter this very day is allowed by Him for His purposes. I've done the whole, God, what, do you, what should I do here and there? And there are times for that we, we seek direction. We seek for God to open doors, close doors. We've all done that. We've, we, we cast out a, a, what's it called, a... a Fleece, there you go. We have that. Fleeces are, you know, fleeces, yeah, can be really confusing and weird. But God purposed and predestined every person to get on his plane, if you will, to eternity. We are called to step on salvation, if you'll see it as a great, a great big plane headed for heaven. He's called all of us, he's allowed all of us the opportunity to step in and go with him. That doesn't necessarily mean that there are people that may as well just give up because God has predestined them to hell. Some people maybe believe that. That doesn't just doesn't sit with my understanding of the, of the character and nature of God. Now, if God wants to do that, we see in the Old Testament, He chose certain people for certain things. I'm going to weigh in on trusting that His purpose for me is for good and for a good life that is expressed in serving and loving Him. That he has not predestined me for anything less than that. I'm going to buy into that. And sometimes we can scratch our head and we can wonder, what is, what is God trying to do and why is he allowing those things? For, for instance, let's just look at what's going on in Israel right now and all the, the mass uh, uh, confusion and killing. The Hamas, you know what their purpose and will is in, in life according to their understanding of Allah? is to take us out. Does that seem like the loving God that we serve? Their purpose is to destroy anyone that professes the God of Christianity or Judaism. What a sad, horrible way to live. My heart goes out to those, those ones that are caught in the, in the fold of that lie and that deception of the enemy. We should pray for the Palestinian people that have been influenced by that kind of understanding, that kind of worldview. It's horrible. But we, on the other hand, stand in the arms or, or, or rest in the arms of the predestination of the good news of Jesus Christ being manifested and fulfilled in our lives. 
It should be no surprise to us what's going on. This isn't necessarily a a last day's message, but I couldn't help it. I felt like God impressed upon me to put up Matthew chapter 26, a few verses, because this should not surprise any of us. Jesus said it this way, watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. There's so much deception today. Even, even the, the, this group of people would try to convince you that their truth is the only truth, that you conform to this truth that they understand in their radical Muslim faith. And what's interesting is you can see how deceptive it has become in our culture. How is it possible that we can have universities teaching this kind of doctrine and that students are buying into it? I mean, I don't have one word for that. It's just one word that that, that works well, stupidity, absolute blind stupidity. Because even if they were honest students of history and even current history, they would understand that that is not true, that what they're proclaiming that Israel has done and is doing is not true. Jesus goes on, he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Wars have been happening since the beginning of time. This is nothing new. But Jesus is reminding us that there will not be a season of peace that will last. The 60s, we were trying to usher in peace for the first time in the world. How did that work out? There have always been, in the middle of that, there was the Vietnam War, World War I, World War II. Some of you, who was around during World War II? There may be a few of you. You don't have to raise your hand. I mean, back then, the church was talking about This could be that, yes, it was true to talk about the the coming of Jesus is soon. It's sooner than it was. And the wars and the rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Now, here's the thing. We have a mandate. God is telling us, Jesus is saying, don't get caught up in all this. Don't march anywhere proclaiming peace for anything. Stay close to me. My peace I leave with you. Stay the course. My will is for you to continue to serve me in spite of the news, in spite of the confusion, in spite of the wars. Don't be alarmed. I don't use an alarm clock anymore. Do you? My old, in my old age, I have this internal alarm clock. I just wake up pretty much the same time every morning. Sometimes I wish I could have an alarm wake me up. But this illustration is simple and it's basic. But we aren't to get rattled. We're not to to jump up and go, oh, oh, what's going on? I'm going to be late. You know, what do I do? We should be the most peaceful people on the planet during the craziest times and seasons. If we buy into the 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 lie and the confusion, the, 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 the worry and the excitement, when we sit down with people and they start to download how horrible the world is and how we should be at the edge of our seat and how we need to wring our hands and be prepared, we should be able to sit back and rest and say, this is, this is nothing new. This is what God has predicted. This is, this is where we are in the time chart of God's perfect will being fulfilled. It says, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. In other words, we're, we, can't, we can't, this stuff's going to happen, but it's going to get worse. Now, Jesus could, everything has been fulfilled in Scripture for Jesus to show up at this moment. But, through the ages, He has waited for His perfect time, and it's not yet here. But we occupy as if Jesus is not coming We work, but we're ready in case He comes right now. That's a hard place to live. It's a difficult place to navigate, but that's what He's called us to do. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We're seeing that. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Wow, He said this 2,000 years ago. Ladies, aren't you thankful that You don't have 2,000 years of birth pains. (laughs) 
Not, I mean, but in the context, time is nothing to God. A second is like a thousand years. So we get caught into this time continuum. But the important thing is that we understand that everything that has taken place in history is fulfilling the ultimate design and purpose of God. All the empires that have risen and fallen, the Persian Empire, the Han Dynasty, just a few of these, the, the Mongol Dynasty, the Ottoman Empire, the Spanish, the Russian, you know what's still the biggest empire on the planet? The British Empire. All these empires that have come and gone, the, the Roman Empire that was 2,000 years, think about it, 2,000 years and finally it fell. Why did it fall? Because of sin. The sin of mankind, disobedience to God, finally crumbled. To, we're 200 years and we're starting to crumble. Why? Because of the sin that we're allowing into our, into our lives and into this country. That doesn't mean we battle against someone else's, but the sin that so easily encroaches upon us to compromise our faith, to make adjustments to the culture around us. When God makes a plan, nothing man plans will ever stop it. So we're on this journey with God. And the New Testament church in this chapter was was. They were just riding the wave of what God was doing. Verse 25, it says, uh, Barnabas and Saul finished their mission. They returned to Jerusalem. They'd already finished one segment of their mission, and they came back and said, okay, what's next? Isn't that exciting to know that the early church leaders were never sat back and rested and said, okay, that's enough. I've done my part. Sometimes we feel that way. I've done my part. I've, I've been in the nursery for 10 years. Anybody that can spend more than a year in the nursery deserves <laughs> to go to heaven immediately. <laughs> I've done my part. But there's a model here for us that our part in God's design and will is never over. I've said this before. We have such a huge resource of experience and giftings in this church because of the age that you are, the wisdom that you have, the ability to pray. Is, is a phenomenal. You know, when you're young, you don't pray. You're too busy to pray, right? I remember probably the first 10 years of my ministry, it was like God, I just put says, God, don't, you know, I'll get to get real prayer, but I got stuff I got to get done for you, right? Because I had all this energy and all this vision and all this vigor. John, you remember that when you were a young farmer? Yeah. <laughs> you get older and what happens? You run out of energy. You recategorize what's important. You, you evaluate your life in light of what you've done and what you realize you can't do and what you can do. I'll give you a little illustration. You probably have all heard of John Ashcroft, Jane Ashcroft, when, when uh, he, was it George Bush was president? He was his attorney general, right? Some of you are looking at me going, no. Well, trust me. He was the attorney general at that time. And when we lived in Springfield, Missouri, and I worked at the college there, uh, John Ashcroft worked at the headquarters of our denomination. He at one time uh, was the president of two of our colleges. And John Ashcroft was a very accomplished spiritual man of God. I mean, he, he was the president of two colleges. He pastored several very significant churches. He wrote numerous books. He was esteemed, and then he also, his son, his, uh, John Ashcroft, I'm talking about his dad. John was his son. John, John's dad, I don't forget it, remember, Brother Ashcroft, that's what I call him, in reverence, because that's what you do when you forget somebody's first name, just brother, sister, right? Makes you found, sound like you're a thousand years old. Well, I was, on a, I was chosen somehow to be on a committee to serve with Brother Ashcroft, John Ashcroft, who was the attorney, his dad. So dad, his dad had taught him what he knew, and John became very, a, a very significant figure. So I'm sitting in this room with John Ashcroft and several other people, and we're planning a prayer, uh, uh, we're planning a prayer vigil, we're planning to move into a season of prayer. This was about two th uh, the year uh, 1985. That dates me a little bit. And I'm sitting there 
with this, to me, this was like sitting with Apostle Paul, I mean, modern day. And he looked at me and he said, Rob, he, said, he says, I've done a lot of things in my life. He was probably in his early 80s. And I was well aware of what he'd done because his picture and his things were all over the headquarters building. You know how we like to hang pictures on the wall and, you know, do this kind of stuff. And, and he said, but you know what? He says, this last year has probably been the most significant year of ministry in my life. I said, really? He's no longer preaching. He's not writing. He's not a president of a college. He's not pastoring a big church. He says, I've discovered the power and the value of prayer. And he says, I have time now to pray without lots of distractions. And he says, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Here's a guy that was like a shaker and mover, famous in our movement. You know, his son was, became the attorney general, and he's saying that my season now To, to solidify this, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, they were worshiping and fasting and praying. I'm sure that the worship and the fast, it all goes together. Fasting is, is accompanied with praying. The New Testament church, even at that early age, recognized that the power of intercession and asking and appealing to God was, was second to nothing else. And what do we see happened? The Holy Spirit said. Now, I'm not saying there was an audible voice. How many of you ever heard of an audible voice of God? If you have, I want to talk to you. I'm really interested. I want to <laughs> see what that was like for you. Most people never hear like Moses did. It's in our hearts. It's something that someone said that is quickened to us. And we think, that, that was the Holy Spirit. And so I'm not saying it was audible, but it was strong. And you know what the Holy Spirit said? I want you to set apart these two men to continue to go after and send them on ahead to Cyprus. I don't want us to minimize the missionaries that we support, the mission emphasis of this church, because a missionary is one that is set apart for a specific call. And the church is the place that should be sending out missionaries. I was privileged to be a part of a wonderful church that during a season of time, I have, I have colleagues, I have peers of mine that there was a season where that church sent out many young men and women into ministry. Some are retired, some are still doing ministry. That is one of the greatest testimonies for that church, I think, of anything that there was a sending out that was taking place. And this virus, if you will, of the gospel, because it was spreading like a virus, it was, it was amazing what God was doing. And look at what happened previously in verse 1. It says they, they had prophets and teachers. The church early on already had distinguished that there were specific uh, gifts given to the church. They said, well, what's a, what's a prophet? We know the Old Testament, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. These were, were prophets. And a prophet was a person that was to proclaim the will of God. And in the New Testament church, like the church should now, we should have people that do the same. We think of prophecy as somebody that knows the future. That is not necessarily in the Old Testament we saw that, but a bigger portion is for people that with passion that will stand up and say it the way it is. Not cut corners, not try and sift everything through cultural language that's acceptable, simply speaking the truth. I don't know if you've ever heard of David Wilkerson or not, but I've mentioned him before, who started Teen Challenge many decades ago, which we're familiar with Teen Challenge. David Wilkerson was a modern-day, I believe, prophet. 
Not popular. Not popular because he spoke truth in such a way that it cut deep. But if you have a chance to pick up his old, uh, his old book that he penned back in the 70s, it's called The Vision. I think it was called The Vision. And everything that the Lord showed him in that book has come to pass. Everything has been fulfilled. Now, I'm not saying that, that you're supposed to write a book. <laughs> I'm not saying that you, but you may have a prophetic ministry that you are not even aware of because you've been afraid to and no one's helped you, encouraged you. If you find yourself speaking truth in love, but ver speaking truth very directly, you may be, have a bit of that in your own life. So they had prophets, and then they had, they had prophets throughout Scripture. Ephesians, Paul would later write this, Paul himself would say, and he himself gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. You can read that in Ephesians. They see an injustice in a situation, and they speak directly to that. They speak it with passion. That's what a prophet does. Can you see this New Testament church gathering together? It would be so different than we do because there would be some real heavy stuff going on. There would be some sending out going on. Now we're so sensitive to somebody getting into our safe space that if anybody tries to tell us anything directly, what gives you the right? Who do you think you are? <laughs> right? It's not about me. It's about Scripture, and it's about what God wants to say to our hearts. I've had prophets speak to me before, not often, but I've had some people speak directly to an area in my life that needed to change I still think we need that now I'm not looking for that and I hope my life doesn't merit somebody having to give me some strong prophetic word but we need to understand that this is biblical stuff this isn't just some na na that was for then this doesn't happen now yes it can the problem is it's there are so many abuses of it that nobody trusts any of it anymore does that make sense there are people that have abused the gifts and the callings of God that has given them, and that's not God's fault, that's their fault. But sometimes the church is the one that hurts because of it. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9 says, If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if I were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in. I cannot hold it in. That's what a prophet, it burns in his bones. It burns in his conscience. Something has to be spoken. What's happening now in the world, there are people in the church that are set, standing up and speaking truth harshly. It needs to happen. And then they had teachers, different than prophets. A teacher with the, the ability to explain something using understandable language that's relevant to the listener so important teaching is critical we have teachers in this church we have gifts in that way and God wants us to utilize and listen and be led by them a teacher is one that is able to use life illustration Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever lived he's the model teacher and what did Jesus do he used the circumstances around the people and he shared in parables and stories and used illustrations that people could understand. And most importantly, he did it out of love and compassion. A genuine concern for the outcome of someone's life. That's what a teacher is. A real teacher, according to biblical truth, is one that comes alongside and mentors and leads by example as well. We don't have teachers today teaching our young people very effectively, do we? We have professors. Professors that are drunk on information. Professors that are, that, that are high on their degrees and their credentials and their ability to articulate. You know who I'm talking about. People that don't really care about the future and the life of people as much as they like to be elevated and seen as profound and esteemed. I've been around professors on both ends of the spectrum that were teachers. I taught for a while in a Bible college, and I had colleagues that taught. And you wouldn't find a more humble, sincere, loving people because they had the Spirit of Christ living in them, and they were given the gift of teaching. 
I've been on the other end where I've been at a university doing graduate work with secular professors that were as shallow and selfish and narrow as anyone I've ever met. It's the world we live in. It's tragic. But the world that the New Testament church has called us to, Jesus has called us to, is to not model that world, but to model his ideology, his philosophy, if you will, his mandate for the world. Because scripture says that heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Isn't that wonderful? You don't have to have a high education to understand that. Just an open, receptive heart. Just someone that is, wants to know the truth. And Jesus said, the truth will set you free. Let me interpret that. What that says is everything else is gone. It, it will be history. It will never even be remembered. But the words of Jesus, the life of Jesus, will live on and give life for eternity. Isn't that powerful? And those words are, are simple enough for a child to understand. A little child can understand even at an early age that they need a Savior because they know they're naughty by nature. <laughs> we have a naughty nature. We don't want to obey. We want to do what we want to do. And when they hear the good news of Jesus, how many of you knelt your, your, your heart before the Lord when you were very young? Raise your hand if it was before 10 years of age. Before you were 10, maybe 15. You innately knew, Dick, I was waiting for you to raise your hand. You, <laughs> you knew at a young age that there was something wrong with you. And the Holy Spirit quickened that. And because you got the word of truth early, my brothers and sisters that have been in the church for many, many years, maybe your whole life, Lord, help us to experience the passion of the power of his word again so that we just don't take it for granted. We take our salvation for granted. This is all I've ever known. I have never known that Jesus didn't. I've always known he's loved me. Sometimes kids out there, they have never heard those words. We've heard it thousands and thousands of times. And we just assume that the world around us is, is filled with the at least the words and some under. They don't. That's why we love doing these kids' things. Some of these kids, Jesus loves you. Jesus died for you. That's a brand new news to them. Revelation says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Trust me, if Scripture is true, and it is, everything we see feel, and touch outside of the spectrum of the kingdom of God and his mercy and his presence is gone. It will one day be gone. It will not last. And we see so many people building their lives on an education, on an income, on the dreams of this perfect life that we have to have because someone has told us, no, the perfect life is a walk with Jesus through all of life's imperfections. That's the perfect life. Struggles and difficulties. And as the New Testament church, as we read on, one of the first things they're going to encounter in the next, uh, after verse 4, they're going to go in and they're going to be confronted with the, by the devil's schemes and lies and deceptions. We're going to see it next week. There's going to be one that was called Bar Ye Jesus. Bar Jesus. He took on Jesus' name to fool people thinking he was a follower of Jesus. And the world we live in is so similar. And we cannot be caught off guard in these days. We need to know that the will of God and the word of God will not be overcome or conquered by anyone or anything less than us allowing it to happen in our own hearts. We need to be so determined to know and love the word of God and know and love the presence of God that no matter what the world throws at us, no matter what comes across the airwaves, no matter what the influences by groups of people, it doesn't matter what their education, what their experience, they're dead wrong when it comes to truth and life 
is only found in Jesus Christ. Well, that really wasn't my sermon this morning, but we're going to wrap it up. <laughs> it was kind of, but I want the worship team to come. There's a whole lot more in this journey with this New Testament church. You know, I think sometimes we, we have taken the spectator sport to such a high level and sometimes it even happens in the church to where we disengage with our genuine involvement with Jesus and we settle for just observing. I, I'm, a, I'm one of the greatest uh, recliner chair backs on, in the world. You know, I'm, I'm in my recliner and I can criticize my guy, and it's like, what a bonehead. What, you shouldn't have thrown that, you should have known. But I'm not there on the field. I couldn't even get at, I, I mean, I'd be dead in the first five seconds. And sometimes as a church, we can even criticize, you know, the church as a whole, and we can sometimes become uh, dormant in our own faith because we think that, well, as long as we're, we're long, as long as we're on the train or on the plane to heaven, that's all that matters. Got my ticket. Jesus is my Savior. That's the temptation for all of us. But I want us to know that God's continuing to work and will work through you and I in this church into the future. Well, Pastor, you say that every single Sunday. I thought about this the other day. You know what? I do. You know why I do it? Because it's true. And that we need to keep that in the forefront of our minds and hearts. We need to continue to march forward. We need to continue to ask for the will of God to be fulfilled in our lives. And I can guarantee you his will is for not for you to sit back and let everybody else just engage. Like John Ashcroft Sr. That's who it was. It was name, his name was John Ashcroft Sr. After 65 years of full-time ministry and building these colleges and doing all this stuff to hear him say when he was in his 80s moving rather slow Rob these are the best days of ministry I've ever had your best days of ministry are ahead of you I really believe that I want you to stand with me we're going to continue to be an extension of the New Testament Church of Acts here in Lebanon, Oregon that been Mennonite Church. Let's sing this song. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me. Because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love.
as it is in heaven. Boy, that's a, that's a, that's a prayer we can pray every day. And before we leave, I want us to, together, I want us to, to speak those words from your heart and sincerity. Lord, may your will be done in my own heart as it is in heaven. I want you to do that with me. Say, Lord, say it together. Lord, may your will be done. May your will be done in my life. In my life, as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Amen. Amen. Go in the power of His will and His presence this week, and take somebody to lunch, and don't make them pay. 